Well, in our last lesson, we examined the idea that God wants his people to practice the spirit and attitude of a joyful pilgrim traveling through a land that is not our permanent one. And that's why the theme of this series is this world is not our home. And we saw this, this idea present in the life of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and in the history of the Exodus and the nation of Israel and the wilderness wanderings. And we also noticed that even after the Israelites reached their permanent home in the promised land, God was very concerned that they maintain that pilgrim spirit and gave them instructions and structured their society in such a way uh, to protect them from harm and prepare them for the tasks that they intended for them to do. He wanted them to maintain that pilgrim spirit. Now in this lesson, we're going to look at several major characters in the Bible and see how God led them into the wilderness. Again, just like he did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was God who, who uh, will be bringing these people into a period in the wilderness. Uh, and we'll, we'll just refer to these as wilderness experiences uh, for, for the purpose of this lesson. And what I mean by that is that it's a time when a person is living or traveling in circumstances where they have limited connection with permanently settled human society and, and the comforts and conveniences of civilization. And it turns out the Bible is full of people who had this type of wilderness experience. And we're going to look at seven of them. But just to show how full the Bible is of this theme, I, we're going to start by not looking at seven others that are present, and we could probably extend this list further. We won't be talking about Hagar, who fled into the wilderness on one occasion and was sent into the wilderness by, by Abraham on a second occasion. Or Joseph, who was thrown into a pit in the wilderness. Or Aaron, who was sent by God to meet Moses in the wilderness. Uh, or we're not going to talk about the scapegoat, which was uh, part of the Day of Atonement, where the sins of Israel were uh, pronounced or confessed on a goat, which was then sent into the wilderness. We'll not talk about Jehoshaphat and how he gained a great big victory for Israel in the wilderness. Or, or the demoniac who, was, who lived in the wilderness until he was healed by Jesus. Or Philip, who met the Ethiopian eunuch in the wilderness and brought him to Christ. Um, and I should say, after I preached this lesson back home in Roanoke, uh, a couple of people told, took me aside and said, we were trying to keep track of who we thought you were going to talk about. And uh, apparently they had made a list and got quite a few right. But one of the ones that they both had on the list was Jesus. And Jesus had some significant wilderness experiences, but we're giving a whole lesson to him. Lord willing, first thing tomorrow morning. And so if you were making a list of the seven, just defer that one until we're going to talk about someone other than Jesus tonight. Starting with Moses. After 40 years of life, Moses thought he had found his purpose in life. It was to liberate his nation from slavery in Egypt. And he had, in fact, found his life's purpose, but it was the wrong time. He only thought he was ready. But his plans failed miserably, and he was now an outlaw. He ended up falling from the pinnacle of one of the greatest civilizations on earth to the company of nomadic shepherds. Uh, and that is how Moses' wilderness experience began. Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 15, we read, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Uh, a little later we read, Moses was content to dwell with a man, and he gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses as wife, and she bore him a son, called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. His native land was Egypt. He knew the courts uh, of Egypt and the peak of Egyptian civilization. Shepherd life was not his native uh, culture. Uh, and he was certainly in a strange land, and he was a stranger there. And the, the name of his first son is a reflection of that truth. But 40 years of shepherding later and living as a stranger, he had almost certainly concluded that he was wrong about his life's purpose and directed and refocused on new pursuits. 
But it is at that moment that God chose to show him that this 40 years in the wilderness had now finally prepared him to deliver God's people in God's way and at God's time. And so let's pick up the story in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. We're told Moses was tending his flock, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, practicing his new profession in the wilderness. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and to look. See this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look on God. And you probably remember the story. It took a lot of convincing. But eventually, this encounter with God in the wilderness renewed his resolve to fulfill his life's purpose of delivering Israel. And that's exactly what he did. But it wasn't until after 40 years in the wilderness that not only was God's timing right, but Moses was truly ready, truly prepared for, to accomplish that task. Now let's turn our attention to the nation of Israel. In our previous lesson, we saw how God took Israel through the wilderness from Egypt to the Promised Land, and we skipped over some details. But the actual trip from Egypt to the Promised Land only took maybe a little more than a year and a half, and that included a year of camping at the foot of Mount Sinai, receiving the law, and building the tabernacle. And so a year and a half after they left Egypt, they had arrived at the border of the Promised Land. Uh, but then they refused to go in. The spies they sent to report on the conditions in the land discouraged the people. Although Caleb and Joshua, the two faithful spies, reminded them that God was with them, they lost heart and complained bitterly against God, and even threatened to stone Joshua and Caleb if they kept trying to urge obedient faithfulness. And God was extremely displeased, and he said so. And so let's read in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 27. This is what he said. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number, from twenty years old and above. Verse 31, but your little ones whom you said will be victims, I will bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. Verse 32, but as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days, each for each day you will bear your guilt one year namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Well, to fill in the picture that we kind of uh, abbreviated in our discussion last night, remember, we talked about how God brought them into the wilderness and led them in a very unique way, and fed them in a very unique way, and that was part of how he taught them. He was humbling them, testing them, and teaching them to be totally dependent on him. But one and a half years was not enough to teach that lesson, because even though he had never led them astray, and even though everything he said came to pass, and so that Bread was provided day by day, and he always led them where they needed to be to 
get, have water and everything else they needed. When they got to the border of the promised land and God said to go in, they didn't trust him. They didn't depend on him. They depended on themselves to judge whether it was safe to enter the promised land that he had promised them, and they rejected him. That's what he said. You have rejected me. And so they apparently needed more time to learn the lesson of dependence on God. And, and God actually said 40 years is the back. Should be sufficient. It was enough for Moses. So perhaps it will be enough for the children of Israel. Uh, and so it will actually be the second generation that goes in. And so they did, in fact, receive 40 more years of wilderness wandering to prepare them to fully trust in God enough to receive his blessings. That was the challenge. Now, another Bible character that had some wilderness experiences is David. The, his wilderness experiences were key to his experience and his preparation as God's servant and king of Israel. Uh, and we find that he grew up in the wilderness, tending the flocks of his father, as his older brother Goliath reminded him when he came to see the battle against the Philistines. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 28, we're told Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, asking about what the deal was with Goliath, and Eliab's anger was roused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Apparently, older brothers can be like this, uh, even in ancient times, as well as at present times. Uh, not cutting their uh, younger brothers much slack or trying to make sure that they're uh, doing everything they ought to do. But uh, his time in the wilderness had prepared David for his extremely famous and notable future. He had not been idle as he was out with the sheep in the wilderness. Rather, he had faced and defeated both lions and bears. And that, along with his great faith, gave him assurance that he could face Goliath as well. And that's what he did that very day. But he, there's no way he would have had the confidence to do that if he had not been out in the wilderness facing the bears and lions prior to being on the sidelines of this battlefield to see Goliath. Well, we're told David uh, was promised by God that he would become the next king. But then God brought David into another wilderness period when Saul turned against him. David initially fled to one of the cities of Judah, but God revealed to David that the men of that city would not protect him from Saul, and so he returned to the wilderness for a period of years. David, uh, in 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, we're told David stayed in strongholds in the wilderness and remained in the mountains in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul, at this time, Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. While hiding in the wilderness, there were kind of two uh, highlight experiences or types of experiences that were prominent. There were times when it appeared that God actually had delivered David into the hand of his enemy, Saul. Uh, and there were times when God actually did deliver Saul into the hand of David. Uh, but each time God apparently delivered David into the hand of Saul, he actually rescued David. And every time God delivered Saul into the hand of David, David delivered Saul, uh, demonstrating <coughs> his true character. And, and let's look at an example of this. In 1 Samuel 23, continuing in verse 24, we read, they arose and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. When David and his, excuse me, when Saul and his men went to seek him, they told David. Therefore he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon, and when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Then Saul went on one side of the mountain, David and his men went on the other side of the mountain, David made haste to get away from Saul, for Saul and his men were encircling David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Therefore Saul returned from pursuing David, and went against the Philistines, so they called that place the Rock of Escape. It was a really close call. It looked like there was no way for David to escape, but at the last minute, 
a messenger arrives saying there's an invasion. We have to defend the land. And David escapes. From these experiences, God learned that God, excuse me, David learned that God was truly with him. And he also learned that he must be faithful and wait for God's timing for fulfilling his promises that he would become king. Let's look at another example, this time the prophet Elijah. There were two major wilderness experiences in Elijah's life. The first occurred when at the very beginning of Elijah's prophetic ministry, when God sent him to pronounce a judgment of drought on the wicked king Ahab and the nation of Israel. God immediately sent Elijah into the wilderness and provided for him there for most of the three and one half years of the drought and famine. And during this time, Elijah was totally dependent on God for his food. Let's remind ourselves of the details of this story in 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here, and turn eastward, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Pretty unusual way to have your physical necessities provided for. Uh, but uh, Elijah was in hiding because he had pronounced this judgment on Ahab, and, and uh, we find out not long after this that Ahab has not only been scouring the nation of Israel, but even going to foreign nations to try to find Elijah, thinking if he can somehow arrest Elijah and threaten his life, that Elijah will cough up some rain for the children of Israel and end the drought on his land. Uh, but that is not how God works. You don't, you don't get blessings from God by threatening his prophets. I'm not sure uh, that Ahab was thinking very straight about that, but I do want us to think about Elijah here. There's a brook that supplies his water, and he's totally dependent on these birds showing up on a regular basis to bring in bread. Uh, and actually, well, the next thing that happens here at that brook uh, is we're told that it begins to run dry because there's no rain in the land. Uh, and so I want you to imagine yourself being a Elijah there in the wilderness, depending on this brook for water and the ravens for food. And uh, it's great to be miraculously or providentially supplied, but then your brook starts drying up. That's something you're going to notice, right? <laughs> uh, and you're going to be worried about, okay, what's going to happen? Um, and what happened next was God said, I want you to go to this uh, widow's house, and I have commanded her to provide for you. And so, um, you know, this is somehow, this is sometimes a circumstance that we find ourselves in in our lives, where God has been providing for us in one way, but then it becomes apparent that that way isn't going to work anymore. But what do we do? We've got to do something. <laughs> uh, and so we try to figure out, you know, what the next thing is going to be. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to be assured that just as God provided for us in the past, he's going to provide for us in the future, even if it's a different way than he provided for us. In the past, those transitions between how God provides for us are kind of troublesome things. They require an awful lot of patience and an awful lot of prayer. And I imagine that's what Elijah was doing, Lord. Uh, you notice the level of the brook Cherith is getting a little low. Uh, are you making uh, other provisions? How is that going to work out? Is there actually going to be rain before it dries up or what? You know, God, God actually knew that Elijah needed both food and water. And so... He, he provided another way for him. He didn't allow him to just perish out there in the wilderness. Well, let's keep thinking about Elijah's uh, second wilderness period. The drought ended with Elijah's return to civilization and the contest on top of Mar Mount Carmel. But Elijah was soon back in the wilderness after he realized that in spite of the great miracle God had worked in the, uh, on the mountain, uh, that Ahab and Jezebel were still ruling and oppressing Israel and threatening him. And so he fled into the wilderness totally 
depressed and discouraged. First Kings 19 verse 4 tells us, He went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die, and said, Is it enough? Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him, and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of wine. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Here he is in the wilderness again, uh, this time feeling pretty depressed and feeling like there's no point in going on. But God, again, miraculously provides both food and water for him uh, and sends him further into the wilderness. Keep reading verse 7. The angel came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights, and as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And so here he is at Mount Sinai, far from the land of Israel, uh, and there God meets with him, and gently but firmly tells him that he has more work for him to do. And he also assures him that he was definitely not the only faithful servant of God in Israel. And he leads this wilderness experience commissioned uh, to appoint uh, Elisha, the next major prophet in Israel, as well as Jehu, the, the next Israelite king that was going to put an end to the Baal worship of Ahab, uh, as well as the next king of Syria he is to anoint. God had much more work for Elisha to do, stuff for Elijah to do. Uh, but it was this wilderness experience that took him from despair to renewed purpose. Well, let's talk about next John the Baptist. Uh, he headed to the wilderness early in life, and there he prepared to be the forerunner of Christ. Luke 1, verse 80 tells us, The child grew and became strong in spirit. And was in the deserts until the day of his manifestation to Israel. When he began preaching his message, uh, his words drew people to the wilderness, and there they saw a man for whom God had been providing all that he needed without the conveniences of their villages and cities. They also heard the message that there was something they were lacking, something that could only be had through true repentance and baptism. And in Luke 3, verse 2 and 2 through 4, we read, While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so here we have this... Uh, this greatest of the prophets, as Jesus would identify him, who uh, prepared for his ministry and practiced his ministry in the wilderness, which in, in his ministry, in effect, called people out into the wilderness to tell them there was something they were missing in spite of uh, the fact that here they were, were, they were in a place where many things were lacking, yet they were finding the spiritual sustenance that they needed there. Uh, and that, of course, prepared them to receive Christ when he came. Let's also talk about Paul, the apostle. He was born in a major city. Troas is not, was not an insignificant city in the Roman Empire. And he was schooled in the metropolis of Jerusalem under the most advanced teachers of Moses' law of his day. But what he most needed to learn, he learned on the road to Damascus. <laughs> It is there that he saw the resurrected Jesus and was, they obeyed, obeyed the gospel and where he was called to be an apostle. And in Galatians chapter 2, he lets us know that his preparation uh, to be an apostle was not done uh, un, by instruction from the other apostles, uh, but rather, if I'm understanding this passage correctly, in isolation in the wilderness of Arabia. Uh, when, when we're reading the account of Paul's conversion in the book of Acts, it of course happens there. He sees uh, the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. He goes into Damascus and Ananias 
tells them, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And so he hears and obeys the gospel, and he's told he's to be an apostle there. Um, but the next thing we read about um, is him preaching in Damascus for a period of time until a significant resistance comes against him and his message, and he actually flees by night. If you remember, he was let down in the basket over the wall, and that's how he escapes the persecution that was the response to his preaching in Damascus. And I want you to keep in mind the fact that after his conversion, he preached in Damascus. Uh, and then in Acts' account, after he left Damascus under persecution, uh, then uh, he went to, uh, to Jerusalem. Okay? Well, here in Galatians chapter 1, let's read what uh, Paul says about that same time, period of time. Galatians 1, beginning in verse 15. When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Well, you know, it's... it's you know, it's uh, definitely not uncommon for different accounts in the Bible to give additional information that isn't found in other accounts. And here we get the additional information that after Paul became a Christian, he spent some time in Arabia, then he returned to Damascus. And all of that happened before he ever went to Jerusalem and met with the other apostles. Now, what we don't, don't get information about here is what he was doing in Arabia. Uh, but uh, as he says in the book of Galatians later, uh, Mount Sinai is in Arabia. That's the same wilderness area where Elijah uh, met with God. Uh, and we're told that he didn't immediately confer with, with flesh and blood. Who did he confer with? Well, the, my supposition, and that's, I can only surmise, is that the gospel that he ta taught, the revelation that he received, was in part given to him in conferring with God in the wilderness of Arabia. Uh, that's my understanding of this passage. And it could be that he was preaching in Arabia. That's another possibility. Uh, but uh, we don't, again, we don't have any definite information about this. But we do know that when he came back to Damascus, when he returned from Arabia, he came back to Damascus, and that is where the story in Acts picks up, that he was powerfully proclaiming Jesus as the Christ there in Damascus and uh, meets stern resistance from the Jews there. All right, so if my if that assumption that I'm making about what happened in, in Arabia is correct, then Paul had a wilderness experience uh, there at the beginning, at the very beginning of his apostolic ministry, uh, and, uh, and either received revelation or began his preaching there in the wilderness preparing for the rest of his apostolic work. Well, uh, let's look at another wilderness experience, this time the woman of Revelation chapter 12. The book of Revelation is filled with symbolic language that may be difficult for us to understand, but in chapter 12, we have a picture of God's people portrayed as a woman who gives birth to Jesus, the king of nations. Uh, and this woman represents true Israel the remnant who faithfully served God for centuries in order to bring the Messiah into the world. Uh, and, and in Revelation 12, we're told that Satan tried to destroy the child as soon as it was born. And Satan, in this chapter, is portrayed as a dragon. But the child is caught up to him. That leaves the woman apparently defenseless, but God has a plan to save the woman from the dragon, and it involves the wilderness. Revelation 12, beginning in verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. God's people still had a job to do on earth, though, uh, even after Jesus was, the Messiah was brought into the world. And God's faithful people are now know, known as the church. And Satan is still seeking to destroy them. But later in the same chapter, we're told the wilderness is again a means of protection for God's people. Continue reading in verse 13. Now when the dragon saw 
that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I don't know that I can give you a point-by-point -point explanation of what these symbols and figures mean, but the picture here is that the wilderness is the means, a means, by which God provided and provides protection for his people, even in times when Satan and those who would follow him uh, are seeking to destroy or, uh, or cause them difficulty. Well, with these seven wilderness experiences, uh, kind of giving a survey and, and getting a picture for what this theme looks like throughout the scriptures, let's put together an idea of what a wilderness experience is as we conclude our lesson. A wilderness experience is a place of hardship, deprivation, and limitation that God turns into a place of growth, transformation, and provision. And the fact of the matter is, as we've seen in these scriptures, God specializes in bringing his people into the wilderness, as well as then turning that experience into a blessing. Read with me Isaiah 43, verse 19, uh, which might kind of summarize the thought of this lesson. God says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Uh, and so wilderness experiences, we would expect and what wilderness experiences naturally mean, uh, means obscurity and deprivation, fear, weakness, lack of progress, limitations, humiliation, and isolation, any, any or all of these things. But for the people of God, the wilderness also means protection, preparation, provision, guidance, sufficiency, growth, strengthening, and dedication. And so, let me just ask you, are, are you in the wilderness right now? Are you suffering some of these things on the left because of the circumstances of your life, perhaps your work situation, or your health situation, or the situation of the society in which you live, and the pressures that you're under? We're all there at certain periods of our life, and perhaps you're there now. But just like each of these examples from Scripture, although you know, we don't choose wilderness experiences for fun, usually uh, there's some crazy people like that. I don't think I'm going to go backwoods kick, uh, hiking uh, across the wilderness. Um, and uh, there's, some, there's some fascination and some joy in that. We usually don't choose to go into this type of wilderness experience. But we can see, can't we, that no matter what the wilderness is, God is able to turn that wilderness experience into something positive for us from a spiritual perspective. Uh, and in many of these cases, David and Moses and Elijah could not have accomplished what they accomplished after their wilderness experience if they hadn't gone through those experiences. And so let God ask him, what is your purpose? What do you bring into my life? What are you trying to teach me in this wilderness experience? As well as declare your faith. I know, God, you will bring me out. You'll provide for me in this wilderness. You'll bring me through, and you will use this to prepare me for whatever you need me to do next. And if we have that attitude, we, we need not fear the wilderness. Because God is there. 
is empty. He can't see you. And because God is there, the wilderness is an okay place to be. It may not be where we choose to be, but it's an okay place to be because we know that God is there. We'll conclude by looking at Psalm 63 together. And we're told this is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And this psalm mentions some of the things that he had to do without uh, when uh, he was essentially dwelling far from civilization, uh, without the comforts of uh, city or village, and, uh, and how he found God, provision, and blessing there in the wilderness. Verse 1, O oh God, you are my God. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. There were times when he was running from Saul where he was as thirsty as a human being could possibly be. I experienced, he, I imagine he experienced profound thirst. And he probably remembers that or it was actually experiencing that the day that he wrote this song. Uh, and yet, what it reminded him of was how much his soul thirsts for God, the living God. Uh, and if we can remember when we're physically thirsty, how much we spiritually thirst for the things of God and for God himself, that will remind us, even at a time when we can't quench our physical thirst, that our deepest and most important thirst always can be quenched. Verse 2, so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. <laughs> the sanctuary was over at Nob. David had had to run from the capital uh, city of Saul and, and uh, was now in the wilderness far from the physical sanctuary. But David said, I looked for you in the sanctuary. He wasn't talking about I made a side trip back to Nob uh, to uh, go to the tabernacle. He was saying that he went to God in worship and prayer and was able to be in God's presence even though in the wilderness he could not physically be where the physical worship of God took place. But he looked for God in the sanctuary to see his power and glory. Verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Well, his life was literally in danger, wasn't it? But there was something that he had, <laughs> along with the fear and danger, that was even more valuable than his life. And that was the loving kindness of God. Verse 5, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fascinating here that, that uh, he says, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. My guess is that they didn't have a whole lot of marrow and fatness while he was wandering in the wilderness, but he could remember what it was like. And while he could wish, boy, I wish I could put a big feast on for these 400 faithful men who are following in the wilderness, the reality is most of the time we're living from hand to mouth and doing with a little less than what we would like to eat. But there was something that was as satisfying as marrow and fatness, and that was the fact that his soul was resting in the Lord. And that allowed him to praise his God with joyful lips. He says in verse 6, When I remember you on my bed, and I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help, and therefore in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. These are the words of David when he was in the wilderness, and he wrote this down to remind himself not only of what he suffered there, but also to remind him that while he was deprived, he was also provided for sufficiently and beyond sufficiently because of his relationship with the God who brought him into the wilderness and who had also promised to bring him out of the wilderness. I hope these thoughts are encouraging to you as we 
face, either at the present time or in the future, our own wilderness experiences. Because the same God that brought David through his, through his is with us in ours, and will see us through ours. If you have any spiritual needs that you need to make your life right with God, we urge you to take action tonight uh, so that you can live for him and have this assurance uh, in the presence of God and hope for the future in eternity. If you need to become a Christian, put on his name and baptism to help you do that. Uh, or if you have any other spiritual needs, come forward as we sing.